Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Good. So, we'll begin. Um, I'm John Bywater, and this talk is called Events, the Modern Objects Orientation. And it's a bit of a new topic for me, so please bear with me if it seems a bit strange. Um, in classical objects-oriented programming, we have been modeling the objects that we see in the world, such as people, organizations, tables, chairs, cats, dogs. We have the uh, has a and is a relation. Uh, we have CRUD and ORMs. Um, we have problems with that called the object relational impedance mismatch. There's a huge Wikipedia page all about that. And it's um, been described as the Vietnam of computer science because you just go there and die. Uh, and because of this, it's actually difficult to make reliable distributed systems. And there's a lot of details there that I just don't have time to go into, but we just have to accept that as the starting point <coughs> for this talk. Um, over the past 10 years, there's been a shift to modeling events. And we model what happens in the domain, such as a person was born, an organization was established, the table was scratched, the chair was moved, the cat died, the dog barked. Uh, modeling events led to something called event sourcing. How many people have heard of event sourcing? Great. So event sourcing is an architectural pattern in which the state of the objects we see is determined by a sequence of events. Um, and the question that I had was how, after working with this for a few years, how general is it? Um, can you do event sourcing only in some places? Or is it a general approach? Uh, there was an article for quite a few years, almost at the top of the Google search results, which said that event sourcing a whole system is an anti-pattern. So, you know, if you want some discouragement, there it is. Um, I didn't know if, <clears throat> if it was something that would go wrong for some reason. I didn't know why it wouldn't work in general, and I just kind of accepted that there would be some limitation to it, and I would get burnt by it if I just carried on regardless. Um, <clears throat> so the question is, can all domains be investigated by asking what happens? Um, and the flip side of that is, if we consider only the events, what do we overlook? What evades our attention if we, if we only look at the events? Um, so I wondered, what is the status of an event in the real world? And how do events uh, relate to the actual entities of classical objects orientation? It turns out this is a massive question in metaphysics, going all the way back to Aristotle, Plato before, and many others since. Um, in the classical conception, what we're expected to believe is that to get a dog, for example, you start with the eternal dog form, and then instantiate a real dog by having substance somehow fill the pure, empty form. It's an idea from the Greeks. It's an ancient or classical idea. It's not a concept that was invented in the modern era. It's an idea that came before notions of growth and development, for example, in biology. It's an idea that came before the Industrial Revolution. It's philosophy before Descartes, Spinoza, Newton, Leibniz, Locke, Berkeley, Hume, Kant, Hegel, Bergson. It's something before the notion in quantum physics that particles are just events on the quantum field. It's something that came way before modern information technology, before we had computers and software. And the trouble with software is that there's no place to hide. If, if it doesn't work, it just doesn't work. And that's what we discovered with this classically conceived objects orientation, especially when it comes to distributed systems, which are in consequence said to be really hard. So how can we update our concepts so they are adequate for the modern world of science and technology in which we live? It turns out that somebody already did a very good job in this area, and that person was called Alfred North Whitehead. And this is a, a picture of him. Whitehead, Whitehead was born in 1861, and he died in 1947. Um, it was said he was a genial sort of person. He was a professor of mathematics at Cambridge and later professor of philosophy at Harvard. Uh, there was a very famous book, Principia Mathematica, um, um, which is Whitehead's most famous mathematical work. It was co-written with his former student, Bertrand Russell. 
Um, it's considered to be one of the 20th century's most important works in mathematics, placed 23rd in a list of the top 100 English language non-fiction books of the 20th century. So he was already quite famous because of that. In his later life, he moved to Harvard and started on his philosophical work, of which Process and Reality is his masterpiece. And Alan Turing, for example, read Whitehead um, when Turing was at school. And we know this from a, um, uh, some records in the library, those that, that, um, of records of, his, of the books that he took out at, at, in the library. And Process and Reality was published in 1929 when Whitehead was 68 years old. And there were eight contemporary book reviews of the 1929 edition. Um, and uh, one person said, the situation can be made clear by saying bluntly that this work surpasses Aristotle's metaphysics and Kant's critique of pure reason for intrinsic importance, though naturally not as yet for historical standing or influence. Uh, a guy called Wieman wrote in his 1930 review, not many people will read Whitehead's recent book in this generation, and not many will read it in any generation but its influence will radiate through concentric circles of popularization until the common man will think and work in the light of it, not knowing whence the light came. After a few decades of discussion and analysis, one will be able to understand it more readily than can be done now. So I'm going to trace some of the ways in which that light has illuminated our work, um, especially through things like pattern language. Um, but... <clears throat> Firstly, uh, Whitehead's philosophy is a process philosophy. Process philosophy is now primarily associated with Alfred North Whitehead. The basic idea of process philosophy seems to be that the future doesn't exist. The past is dead. Um, uh, process philosophy is traced back to a Greek called Heraclitus, uh, 500 BC, um, who was famous for his insistence on ever-present change as being the fundamental essence of the universe, and for saying, no one ever steps into the same river twice. This is commonly considered to be one of the first digressions into the philosophical concept of becoming. The phrase, nothing in the world is constant except change and becoming, is attributed to Heraclitus. And in the 1920s, Whitehead wrote, the ancient doctrine that no one crosses the same river twice is extended. No thinker thinks twice. And to put the more matter more generally, no subject experiences twice. Uh, Whitehead was um, very quotable. Uh, he really didn't like people just taking quotes out of his book, but, but it's kind of a fun thing to do. Um, one, uh, one thing he said was, the safest general characterization of the European philosophical tradition is that it consists of a series of footnotes to Plato. So that's perhaps his most famous quote. Uh, but this quote about fish is also quite well known. I saw it on a train poster once on the train to Cambridge. Um, just, you know, um, ideas do not keep. Something needs to be, uh, something needs to be done about them. And um, so let's look at the, the scheme of ideas itself. Whitehead called a system of ideas in his book, Process and a Philosophy of Organism. Uh, philosophy of organism is the doctrine that the creative advance of the world is the becoming, the perishing, and the object immortali objective immortalities of those, those things which jointly constitute stubborn fact. Whitehead wrote, the philosophy of organism is a cell theory of actuality. Each ultimate unit of fact is a cell complex, not analyzable into components with equivalent completeness of actuality. The cell can be considered genetically and morphologically. And that distinction is taken forward by Christopher Alexander in his, in his later work. And these are some of, the, some of the different concepts involved in it. And I'll touch on, on those just now. Uh, firstly, creativity. Uh, Whitehead invented the word creativity. We have the word creativity in our language because of Whitehead. Um, his previous word was creativeness. Um, uh, so creativity is without a character of its own in exactly the same sense in which the Aristotelian matter is without a character of its own. It is that ultimate notion of the highest generality at the base of actuality. It cannot be characterized because all characters 
are more special than itself. Um, he reaches back to Plato and finds more or less his whole system captured in this snippet. Um, this conception of an actual entity in the fluent world is little more than an expansion of a sentence in Plato's Timaeus, but that which is conceived by opinion with the help of sensation and without reason is always in the process of becoming and perishing and never really is. And for the people who've heard of monads, um, Whitehead said that his system is a monadology, but the difference between his monads and Leibniz's monads is that Whitehead's monads don't change. Um, so the big question is, what are the actual entities? The classical answer is that the actual entities are instances of substance quality categories. So the the brown dog and so on. If you can, and you can in the attempts to model the real world with objects, uh, you can see it in the attempts to model the real world with objects such as cats and dogs and people and organizations and tables and chairs. Whitehead's move was to assert that the classical idea suffers from the fallacy of misplaced concreteness and that the actual entities are occasions of experience. So he said, the current accounts of perception are the stronghold of modern metaphysical difficulties. They have their origin in the same misunderstanding which led to the incubus of the substance quality categories. The Greeks looked at a stone and perceived that it was gray. The Greeks were ignorant of modern physics, but modern philosophers discuss perception in terms of categories derived from the Greeks, and so does classical objects-oriented programming. Whitehead's big claim is that the actual entities are occasions of experience, and he calls these creatures. Whitehead said there is no going behind actual occasions to find something more real. Um, the name event was given to a nexus, or multiplicity or network of such occasions, with the simplest event having only one occasion. Um, so, building up the conception here, actual entities involve each other by reason of their prehensions of each other. There are thus real individual facts of the togetherness of actual entities which are real, individual, and particular. So, um, a society of events is when the elements of an axis are united by a defining characteristic that is common to all of them, or that they have all inherited from one another, or acquired by a common process. And some societies have what Whitehead calls personal order, which, um, which is where the events are ordered as a series of events. Um, and this is remarkably close to the notion of event-sourced aggregates. Um, then we have um, the enduring physical objects. The real actual things we encounter in the world are all societies. Whitehead also calls them enduring physical objects. A building is an enduring physical object. For that matter, so am I myself. Uh, a society also can have many strands of personal order. The name Whitehead uses for this is corpuscular society, a collection of entities, each with a personal order. For example, the individual histories of all the people at a conference, or the taste buds on your tongue. This is remarkably similar to a collection of event-sourced aggregates in an event-sourced application. Um, there are also these things he calls eternal objects, which is a kind of update of um, Plato's eternal forms. Um, so eternal objects are forms of definiteness, pure potentials realized in a particular actual entity contributing to its definiteness. Eternal objects tell no tales of actual occasions. There are no novel eternal objects. Whitehead defines eternal objects as follows. Any entity whose conceptual recognition does not involve a necessary reference to any definite actual entities of the temporal world is called an eternal object. This means that eternal objects include sensory qualities like colors, blueness or greenness, and tactile sensations, softness or roughness, conceptual abstractions like shapes, a helix, a dodecahedron, and numbers, seven, or the square root of minus two. 
moral qualities like bravery or cowardice, physical fundamentals like gravitational attraction or electric charge, and much more besides. An eternal object can also be a determinate way in which a feeling can feel an emotion or an intensity or an adversion or an aversion or a pleasure or a pain. All events have feelings, but not all have higher grades, have the higher grade of feeling that we might refer to as conscious intellectuality. However intelligent you might be, you can't be conscious of everything that happens to you. Um, and Whitehead gave a definition of function, which is to contribute determination to events. As Ward Cunningham wrote in Episodes, um, programming is the act of deciding now what will happen in the future. In general, since events are self-creating, this is remarkably similar to the notion of herding cats, which is a phrase I used to hear quite a lot in software development offices. Uh, reflects an incomplete control that managers have in, a, in any creative industry. Um, so we have also this notion of chaos. A non-social nexus is what answers to the notion of, of chaos. Um, so system, um, frameworks like Kinevan um, have this domain of chaos that you try and move away from, but actually it's more complicated than that, or perhaps simpler. Um, so we have this, this diagram here, which I just get up. Um, Whitehead said that events have four stages. You can see the four stages in this diagram. Um, you can use the diagram to model anything by turning the different bits of text into questions. Uh, the first stage is datum, the objective content of the experience, facts from the settled world, objectifications and subjective form resulting from processes of appropriation which Whitehead calls feeling. Uh, the second stage process solves the question of what the event is to be. It finds a settlement in its datum. The third stage, satisfaction, forms a subjective unity or harmony. Um, and the harmony there is exactly the same thing that Christopher Alexander uses in his, in his pattern language. It's just exactly the same. The final satisfaction is the individual unity of the event that makes it what it is. The fourth, fourth stage is the decision, which constitutes the event's actuality as a stubborn fact which cannot be evaded. Whitehead wrote, thus the datum is the decision received and the decision stage is the decision transmitted. And in between these two are process and satisfaction. The subjective aim um, is a proposition and the function of a proposition is to lure feeling. Uh, and the, the subject of the event is the event itself. Uh, to briefly look at the episode which gave us process and reality, um, I've arranged this slide following Whitehead's four stages of an event. First, the datum. Whitehead read the Greeks in Greek when he was a boy. We can read in his book, Process and Reality, that Whitehead found the considerations of the Greeks and the ideas of Plato, Aristotle, Descartes, Kant, Hume, Newton, and so on, a mixed bag, although he found many things he liked, to which he says he recurred, he felt there was an overall incoherence and individually their ideas mistaken in various ways, and in consequence rather labored. Whitehead wrote, an endeavor has been made to point out the exact points of agreement and of disagreement. He appropriates their work, he makes his own propositions, reworking things whilst giving lectures until he reaches a satisfaction. Then his book is printed, all his notes and manuscripts were destroyed when he died on his wishes. So all we've got really is this book. That's, that was Whitehead's process. Um, and then if we look at pattern language, Whitehead was enormously influential for, for Christopher Alexander. Uh, I've checked this with his, his friend. He, he, he really was influenced quite a lot by him. Um, you can see it in, in his book, The Timeless Way of Building. Um, you can also see it when he refers to Brian Goodwin's work, which was directly influenced by Whitehead. And this quote was um, pointed out to me by James Coplin. I was trying to find some quotes before. There's quite a lot of things in there, but I think this is probably the best one where Alexander says, and finally, of course, I want to paint a picture which allows me to understand the patterns of events which keep on happening in the thing whose structure I seek, 
In other words, I hope to find a picture or a structure which will, in some rather obvious and simple sense, account for the outward properties for the pattern of events of the thing which I'm studying. And it's not really apparent, really, when you look at pattern language to begin with, that he's, he's really talking about patterns of events. There's a, it's not necessarily so clear that that's what's happening, but that's really where he's coming from. And in software development, um, Christopher Alexander was enormously influential for Ward Cunningham, uh, inventor of WikiWiki. He also authored a number of pattern languages, for example, Episodes, published in 1995. Um, episodes describes a method of software development. In this pattern language, everything is an event. The re really remarkable fact about this text, and the reason I included it in this talk, is the close resemblance to what Whitehead said about events, in particular the four stages of an event, and the notion of becoming quite visible here. So Ward Cunningham in the introduction to his episodes, which is a kind of precursor to extreme programming, um, uh, we are particularly interested in the sequence of mental states that lead to important decisions. We call a sequence an episode. An episode builds towards a climax where the decision is made. Before the decision, we find facts, share opinions, build concentration, and generally prepare for an event that cannot be known in advance. After the climax, the decision is known, but the episode continues. In the tail of an episode, we act on our decision, promulgate it, follow it through to its consequences. We also leave a trace of the episode behind in its products. It is from this trace we must often pick up the pieces of thought in some future episode. So you can see there's kind of facts through some kind of process to another fact, and then you, you're just working with a settled world of facts that you have, and then the, 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 the development repeats. Um, and another thing, Scrum, I'm sure lots of people heard of Scrum, um, is defined with an artifact which results from the actual occasions of the Scrum events. So Scrum uh, prescribes four formal events um, for inspection and adaption as described in the Scrum events section. S uh, sprint planning, the daily Scrum, sprint review, and sprint retrospective. And you can obviously read more about Scrum. but. Um, I just think it's interesting that there's, there's, there's aspects to software development which aren't really conceived as events, like how the team comes together, how the, how, you know, the, the occasion of software development itself is constituted seems not so well, not so well worked out um, as an event. Um, anyway, so what happens if we look at distributed systems as a multiplicity of process events in which domain events may be generated? Can we be more um, definite about reliability in a distributed system that processes domain events by being more definitive about what actually happens in that processing? So if we want to make a system that is reliable, what can we actually rely on? Is it possible to define the process events in terms only um, in terms of only things that we can actually rely on? So what can we rely on? Well, we've got ACID database transactions, which are 100% reliable. And the other thing that's 100% reliable is, is counting. Um, and it turns out that we can build distributed systems based on just those two things. Um, so just to step through this, firstly, unreliable propagation. This is a kind of basic, the basic approach that w we start with, really. Um, we, we execute a command, and then notifications of the domain events are sent over a message bus, like RabbitMQ or something. Uh, this is unreliable because if the domain events are written first, then the notification might not be sent, and if the notification is sent first, then the domain events might not be written. Even if the domain events are written atomically, and the view updated atomically, it remains that the notification isn't atomic with the domain events, and the consumption of the notification isn't atomic with the updating of the view. So there's lots of ways in which it can go wrong. If you imagine your system just crashing at any point in time, if it just happens to go wrong before, in between one thing happening and the other thing happening, that you're expecting both things to happen, then it's going to go wrong and you're going to see that somehow in the, in the state of the application. Um, so if you want to do reliable propagation, um, uh, 
the notifications and the domain events need to be written atomically. And if the view is updated atomically with a tracking record that shows which notification was last processed, um, we can use counting to sequence and follow the notifications. And if processing is resumed using tracking, if the thing crashes and you resume, if it's resumed using tracking information, then propagation and projection of the state of the application will be reliable. Uh, for details about doing this with notification logs, um, Vaughan Vernon, in his book, Implementing Domain-Driven Design, uh, explains quite well how to do this with notification logs and archived sections of these things. Um, and we can take this at least one step further by replacing the view with an event-sourced model. So now we have um, the place that I wanted to end up. If we, make <coughs> if we make the view event source, then we are basically projecting the state of one application into the state of another application. In this case, we have to put three things in the database atomically. The tracking information, so where you are in the sequence that you're consuming. The domain events, which is the new state that you're producing by processing that notification. And the notifications of those domain events that others may consume. And um, that more or less defines what a process event is. Uh, so using only counting and local atomic database transactions, so long as the infrastructure allows the process to advance at all, the event processing can happen absolutely reliably. The new notifications allow the projected state to be pro propagated to another application. In this way, such applications can be composed to make reliable distributed systems and such a system is reliable as its atomic database transactions, which is 100% reliable. And you can just do, you can have a chain of these 100 things long, and by the end, you will have perfect replication. There's no, there's no, um, there's no real chance, there's no way in which it can go wrong, because everything's just tied down. Um, so here's that uh, process event drawn as an event in the same diagram sort of shape as the as Whitehead's event with the four stages. Uh, the subjective aim is perhaps to keep up to date. The datum is more or less the domain event notification, the current application state and the application policy itself. The process is to apply the application policy whenever there is a new domain event notification. The satisfaction is the new domain events that satisfy the application policy. And the decision is whether records of the process events actually written into the database, or perhaps not, depending on infrastructure failure. So you can see, you're going to record the whole process event or not. And if you don't, then when you resume, you'll, that's the thing you'll do. And you'll try to do that until it's done, and then you'll move on. Um, and then I tried, just for fun, just to write this as a, as a path. And I know the text's really small. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, and it probably needs more work, but basically it says that by using counting to sequence the domain events of an application and atomic database transactions to record each process event, application state will be entirely unaffected by infrastructure failures. And um, so we can create these process applications where we factor out the process event functionality um, and that allows an entire system of applications to be defined independently of infrastructure, uh, not just the domain model. So in domain-driven design, the, the encouragement is to try to make a model that's independent of infrastructure and to bind the model to infrastructure at runtime. But if you can make a process application, you can define a, a system where a number of process applications are linked together, um, and you can define the whole thing independently of infrastructure. Um, and the infrastructure is only involved when the systems run, and that gives you the opportunity to use different runners for different purposes, single-threaded, multi-threaded, multi-processing, running on your cluster. Um, so the th single-threaded thing is really nice for development, and then you can deploy it and expect to get exactly the same behavior from a, from a, a properly distributed system. And um, I, just to, coming to the end there, uh, I developed a library for event sourcing in Python. It was developed over several years from real-world professional projects, just gradually refactoring out things that actually worked. Um, the library implements the basic event sourcing stuff and also the process event stuff. 
uh, allowing you to define a reliable distributed system independently of infrastructure. Um, as far as I can tell, this is a genuine innovation that hasn't so far been implemented in any other language. Um, I asked Eric Evans about this in Amsterdam earlier this year, and he said he hadn't seen it before, and also that I'd systemized it really nicely. Um, so the, the idea from domain-driven design is that if you, if you can partition a conceptually cohesive mechanism into a separate lightweight framework, uh, particularly watch out for formalisms, for well-documented categories of algorithms, expose the capability of the framework with an intention-revealing interface, now the other elements of the domain can focus on expressing the problem, delegating the intricacy of the solution to the framework. So that was the reason why I, I thought it was justified to, to make a library. And at the time, a few years ago, the general advice was that event sourcing is so simple that you just don't need a, you don't need a separate library. You can just do it fresh every time. But it, it just turns out not really to be true. Um, anyway, uh, this code is available under MIT, uh, under a um, permissive license, Berkeley Three Cores license, I think it is. Um, and it's on GitHub on the, um, under my name, that URL, uh, John Biotis slash event sourcing. Um, I'll be running a workshop, I think it's at one o'clock, um, introducing this library, and I hope that some of you um, will come along. That's my talk. Thank you.